it just reminded me that we have all of these books, articles, uh, things that we watch online, and isn't this a perfect place to, to talk about them? So I wanted to call this section um, TED Talks, but it just didn't feel right. So something that I have gleaned in the last six years is that if you look, if you're on Gallery View right now, or if you're not on Gallery View, go to Gallery View, look at these faces, look at these names. Everyone in here is an expert on stuff. Uh, most cat everyone's an expert would be a good way to just hear what's on some people's minds. So Armando has decided that he would share with us. Then Christina, I'm gonna put you after Armando. Mata Cruz. And then Chris is gonna conclude, and Chris is gonna conclude in a cool way because he's gonna help us bridge into uh, our discernment process for regional leadership. So without further ado, Armando uh, and all the presenters, you have screen sharing abilities, however you like. Uh, I think we have the patience for about no more than eight minutes, nine minutes to open space. So Armando, you, my friend, are now taking over everyone's screen, whether we like it or not. Cool, because I don't even like speaking to people, so I'm just, you know, really quiet, and I don't know why he did that to me. Uh, anyways, I'm excited to be with you, uh, and excited to see all your smiling faces, and uh, Bishop was awesome, and Hector finally changed his name, so now I don't have to call him Bishop. Cool. Um, very exciting. So, you know, I, uh, when, when uh, Morris kind of reached out to me, I was like, you know, I, what do you want me to speak about? And he was like, whatever, whatever you're reading, whatever you're thinking about. So, um, I told them that right now, I mean, the, the reality is, and, and you may be in the same boat that we are, uh, all of us are, are struggling with time. All of us are struggling with way more on our plate than we could potentially do. All of us are, are race basically trying to do more with less. And so if, if there's anything that's on my mind kind of regularly is, is time management and efficiency. Um, how do we automate, delegate, or eliminate from our, off, from our lists on a regular basis? Because if you're not doing it quickly enough, if you're not doing it, um, if you're not doing it regularly, then the list piles up and you can't get more done. Um, as you may be aware, in our diocese, we have we've lost a lot of people, and uh, there's a lot of colleagues who, at this point, uh, are no longer with us in ministry. Some of us have been now given extra roles to try to do. So this idea of uh, of the Eisenhower matrix, if you're familiar with the Eisenhower matrix, uh, to me is important. Because if we're not doing it uh, intentionally, strategically, then we're missing the boat. And so in some ways, that's kind of what I wanted to highlight with you is how are you making these decisions? And by these decisions, uh, how are you doing them quickly? Because if you're not doing them quickly, then you are slowing down the process for the next thing that's coming up. Now, it doesn't mean you don't, you don't take into consideration. It doesn't mean you're not praying about it. It doesn't mean you have to just do it on the instant but it does mean that we need to move quicker than we're used to moving. It means that we need to make decisions quicker than we're maybe used to having. Maybe we've had opportunities to discuss it, to pray about it, to read books beforehand. We don't have that luxury right now. Uh, if you've heard me speak before, and I think I've said this for the last two, three years, I was already seeing kind of at the, at the horizon, I was already seeing us in ministry uh, suffering because money was, go was going down. And so this COVID only made this go a lot quicker. Uh, so we have, we basically have been shoved into this new reality where there's less resources. And so we're going to need to be better strategic, intentional leaders. And if we're not, we're missing the opportunity to engage. And so uh, my invitation, my exhortation, my challenge to you is that you find ways, um, you find teams, you find um, kind of that leadership inside of you and that spirit inside of you that's, that's guiding you to really say, how am I truly automating, delegating, or eliminating? Because when you can't do that well, you are slowing down the process to get next steps moving. Your decisions or lack of decisions is part of the leadership that you are being, that's being placed on all of us. And so part of that invitation is to engage. I don't know if I shared this with you specifically, but um, one, of the, one of the resources that I've been sharing, I don't know why I've been sharing it more often, but it seems to be very relevant. If you've heard it before from me, I apologize but I think it's an important uh, resource. If you've never read, there's a, there's a book by Will Mancini uh, called Church Unique, and it's all about ministry leadership and how do you cast vision? How are you clear with your vision? How are you presenting vision well? So that when you do that, you engage people. And what we're doing right now is engaging new people sometimes because we need new people to be engaged. So I love his, his way of explaining it, and he, he uses it as a ship model. He says, imagine that you're a captain of the ship. And as the captain of the ship, your job is to do two things. 
to engage volunteers, people, funds, resources. You want to get people on your team. In order to do that, in order to get that contribution, you need really good clarity. The better clear, the more clear you are with your message, your mission, the better you are at engaging people, at getting more money, getting more volunteers. So he basically uses the axis and he says, clarity of mission, clarity of what you need, and contribution is key. And he says, basically what you have is four different possibilities. So let's see if I can take off my virtual background and see if you can see my uh, screen. So basically what I'm showing you is his basically model that says, clarity versus contribution. The more clarity and contribution that you get, the more you get crew members or people who are on board with you and are team players. If you have good clarity, but not good necessarily contribution, they're what are called passengers on your boat. They're there, they're totally on board. They maybe understand your mission, but they're not doing any of the work. They're just passengers. Your problems are the bottom half of this. If you're not clear about what you need, <laughs> and there are no contribution going on, these people are what we call stowaways, right? And these stowaways are just there, but that's all that's going on. Sorry if you're getting seasick by me moving. I apologize. <laughs> it's going with my boat, okay, analogy, go with it. Uh, and then the last one is, is that contribution. These people are contributing, but they are not in line with your vision. And so, and so in some senses, this group of people are what we call pirates, right? Because in some ways they are taking over with their own mission, their own plan, their own ideas, because they're not clear on what they need to be done from you. So basically all of this goes back down to leadership, right? You are leading this ship and you have these four types of people that you will be talking to, connecting with, engaging. Your invitation is to make them either crew members or at least passengers on your ship so that they at least know where the ship is headed. Be those types of leaders. And if you can do that with a combination of automation, delegation, and elimination, then you'll be set for really good um, leadership and really good movement forward uh, in your organization. So hopefully I didn't confuse you or make you too seasick, but hopefully that is helpful in your ministry. Everybody good. Christina, I'm gonna spotlight you and you should have a screen sharing ability. So take it away when ready. There we go. I have a, a short pair. Uh, All right, perfect. PowerPoint too. Anyway, so um, it's here, but I put the link on that PowerPoint for you. Oh, where is it? I can't see. Oh, back up space. Um, so anyway, um, I never heard Shane Bennett. He is from Net Ministries in Australia. Um, I know you guys have all heard Randy. Um, I was, you know, Randy's always inspirational. Shane was somebody new to me, and I was really inspired by him too. And it starts, um, actually, they don't start this. This is kind of the center of the talk. It comes to this concept of the super tide. And I'll be honest, I've heard of super tide before. I wasn't really that familiar with it, but it really just left me intrigued um, by this concept that the super tide, it's, it's basically an alignment of the earth, moon, and sun, they come together. It happens about every 18 years in, in different places around the world. And it's just a strong gravitational pull. And what happens is the tide goes out super far, further than it ever goes, even during what would be like a normal king tide, which happens a couple times a year. And in that time, um, we get to see some really unique things. And um, so, for example, uh, and, and when you look at a super tide, if you like look and actually, because I actually went and Googled it afterwards, I was like, what is a super tide? I want to learn a little bit. It tells us what's really under the water. Um, you know, we probably have seen some erosion. We know that there's probably some environmental damage, um, but it allows us to really see what's happening. Um, the second thing it does is allows us to glimpse at the future and everyday water levels that are going to come forward in the future. And the third part of the super tide is kind of cool. Once, once the tide goes out, it's going to come in. But what's really neat about the tide coming in is it comes in um, at a higher level than it's been in a long time. Um, and so there's some inspiration, I think, that we can take from this concept of super tide and what they talked about. And so looking at COVID-19 as a super tide, this is kind of what they shared from the story. And we probably can come up with our own things as well. Um, 
first of all, youth ministry got it. You know, we were able to adapt quickly. We know how to use digital resources. I'm not saying it was perfect, but we were able to do something. We were able to move. Um, we know that our church overall was slow to adapt. Um, and it made us more aware of issues that already existed. Um, for example, the acceleration of the nuns and the duns. And I have a little asterisk because that didn't come from this particular webinar. I actually heard that on a different webinar, but I couldn't find the source. I um, emailed John Renato though, and he goes, I think that was me who said it. And I got it from a source and I can't quote it for you yet. So, um, so know that was somewhere along the lines. And um, I think the other thing it does is it ask, makes us ask questions um, as we move into um, looking at this time of the COVID-19 as a super time. It's a game changer, right? It allows for an opportunity for us to examine answers. So I provided that handout and basically what that handout is, it has the video, but then it has a whole bunch of questions that I took from this webinar. Some of them were asked it, it implicitly and others explicitly. Um, but I just thought, gosh, what a moment for us to pause and ask some really good questions um, and, of ourselves, but also of our ministry leaders too. Um, and then uh, to really give an opportunity during the super tide, why the tide is out. Um, Armando talks about making um, decisions quickly and acting quickly, but I also think we need to make pause and say, are we going to, we want to try things and we do need to make things um, quick in, in response, but it's an also a time for us to say, you know, is there a better way we can do things and work towards that, even if it's not a perfect response at this moment. Um, it allows for us then to plan to move forward. It's a unique time. It gives us a viewpoint we typically don't see. And so what has um, come out, and I already shared a little bit of that with you, but are there some other questions I think that are really important that they raised? What, um, what needs to go? What is no longer working? Um, and I kind of already shared a little bit about that as well. But one of the things I thought that was interesting they had pointed out is it ended end up bickering between groups in the church. Um, this is really truly a time for us to come together. And, and I think we collaboratively have done that as a, as a region. And I know some of our dioceses are doing, I know I do that. But working together with our DRBs, working together with our superintendents, working together with um, the people in different ministry offices and saying, how do we come together? How do we also collaborate with these other organizations organizational groups that are out there? How do we also look especially with our ethnic ministries and how are we seeing ourselves as partners and moving forward that we really do need each other? Another question that was posed is what's um, left when the church doors are closed? You know, I think so often we've centered around um, as the traditional churchgoer is the Sunday mass, right? I go to Sunday mass, I did my obligation and I go and nothing outside of that exists. Um, and so how do we sit there and, and explore the context that everything is not just within the context of the math we, mass. We don't just live our faith within that Sunday hour that it expands. Um, and so um, how do we help others do that as well? And then, um, to realize that this is a, a gift of time, that we also need to recognize that God is talking with us. He's, he's saying something way more to us, something new to us. Um, you know, we could see structures of the past don't meet the, cur the needs, um, current needs. We also um, see a need for creativity that we have been able to dive in. We haven't always been able to dive into because we've been stuck in the, well, we just need to do it this way for now. But now we have this opportunity that breaks us off because there is no such thing as a normal right now that really allows for us to break into that creativity, to recognize the blessing in our own poverty and richness. You know, we know the poverties that are existing, um, the weaknesses that we have as church, and to say, okay, you know, there's a blessing and we know what those are, and there's a richness to know that we can learn from those and we don't have to go back to them, that we have the total grace to move forward and never go back here. And to also look at, you know, that, that God is releasing a lot of grace at this time. And are we open to it? To remember our hope is in the Lord and that ultimately it's going to be about him bringing about renewal. And that some things, again, need to die so that new could occur. And so what do we really need to do to prepare for the super tide? Um, they shared, first of all, you know, the super tide, when it comes in, that's like the Holy Spirit moving in. It's going to be a time of revival. I know it's going to be slow. Right now we are going, okay, people, are you coming back to church? But I got to say these past couple weeks in Reno, our numbers, like we're only allowed to have 50 at our parishes for mass at a given, you know, time slot. And our masses are all over 50. It's an issue. It's an issue that we are at our max. I mean, that to me says volumes about 
um, how the Holy Spirit's moving. I mean, yeah, it's only 50 people and that doesn't sound too exciting. Oops, um, sorry, my Siri turned on here. Um, and so I think we need to, to see that and recognize that the grace is happening. Sorry, Siri wants to do something weird. Um, so um, for us to recognize that though, is that the grace is, is here and people are coming back. It's gonna be slow, but we also need to be able to be quick to respond to that in terms of you know, our parishes, our, our, our ministries, our, our communities as a whole, are they ready to be hospitable? hospitable? Are they ready to really truly be community to each other, welcoming to each other? Because also the other thing, I was just talking with a pastor yesterday, he was sharing, he goes, I have received more new parish registrations in the last month than I did over the course of the last year in one month. I mean, that says that there is some awesome stuff happening to me. Um, and so as we move forward to think about what does it mean and, and what do we need to do is to look at being also encounter driven is what they shared. Um, you know, that we need to think about people coming around the mass and the Eucharist to develop relationships with Christ, but then to also live that encounter out in, in further ways. And that's where this if question comes in, Pope St. John Paul II talks about uh, these encounters, especially within uh, the springtime and missionary activity. Um, but the thing is, there's this um, un, unasked question of if, that if is how are we going to respond? Are we gonna to respond to God's grace? Are we gonna to respond to our own baptismal grace? Are we gonna to respond to the gift of confirmation? Are we saying yes to the power of the Holy Spirit to move and engage us? Are we saying yes um, to asking God, um, how do we move beyond what's next? It has to be about what you want to do. Are we asking him honestly what he wants us to do? And it's no longer to be missionary. It's not enough to just be a disciple. We have to be missionary disciples. Um, we have to realize that seeds have been planted during this COVID time. I think we've seen that a great example of that in our families who've come together. What a beautiful seed for us to say, wow, how do we continue to water and tend that in our families? Um, how do we recognize the work of God that is taking place and is going to continue to take place? And, and I think they did a really great thing of saying, you know, this isn't about big programming in the end. It's realizing, A, that God is working and he's doing miracles. He's been doing that forever, right? But are we slowing down enough to recognize that God is moving in our own personal lives? And then are we having the courage and the strength to realize, or even just the awareness, first of all, that it's not a coincidence, but it's a God incidence. And are we not afraid to share that? And are we okay to share those stories with others? Um, we often underestimate the power of God. Um, we can find God to what we can conceive, but to remember that God is so much more than that. And it's about a simple response of the heart. Have we really been responding to our baptismal grace again, the gift of confirmation, um, saying yes to how God could use us? Um, I think this is a beautiful quote. This was said by Shane. Beginnings of great transformations take place in the hearts of individuals. I love this quote. I think it just says, you know, what are we asking for God in our own lives? Um, and how is that going to transform our ministries that we are in, um, called to lead? Um, and then also, you know, these are things that we can just find in our inner, inner room is, you know, diving deeper into our own prayer life. I think now is the time, you know, yeah, we do need to make quick decisions, but we have to have those decisions rooted. And I think that goes back to where, where are we in our own prayer lives and taking a challenge to that. It's not about necessarily fancy projects. Robert um, wrapped up with three things he took from the talk. And so I'll just share those. He said, the, few, the, the church of the future is encounter, a church where everyone has a personal relationship with the Lord a church that dedicate, is dedicated to evangelization. They talked a lot about that. I didn't get into that very much. And the tide may be going out, but will rise higher than before. Um, hey, Christina, perfect example in terms of, uh, no, I, I'm not going to present. I, I don't feel comfortable presenting. I don't know what I'm an expert in. And then boom, look at this beautiful presentation. Well played. Mara Cruz, to keep the learning going. I believe you should have screen sharing abilities. Let me know if you need some. I got it. Thank you. All right. Okay, so hi, everybody. Um, when Stephen approached me about doing a topic, I was like, well, what are we going to talk about? And he's like, anything, go for it. Um, so I gave it a really basic name, Back to Basics. And it's something that I used to do in youth ministry. Um, the last couple of years, I had a group of kids 
um, just to kind of check in on them, see how they were doing, because even before pandemic, we know high schoolers are very stressed. And they have a lot going on, a lot on our plates. And I know Armando shared with us about how some of us have, you know, been overloaded since March. We've been doing a lot of work. We've been doing a lot of um, catching up, trying to make sure that everybody's okay. Um, but I also wanted to make sure, you know, how are we doing? I know we focus in community. We focus in, you know, making sure that our families are okay, that our friends are okay. But it's sometimes good to kind of take a step back and wonder how are we doing? Um, I love this quote. Do you know that, uh, excuse me, this um, Bible passage, do you know that you are a temple of God and that the spirit of God dwells in you? You know, we talk so much to our kids, to our young people, you know, you are the church, your body's a temple. And, you know, we have to reciprocate that same, you know, feeling that same action that we're telling our kids to do or our young people to do. And like I said, this is very basic. This was something that I wanted to share with you because it's something that sometimes we forget. The first basic one, water, the importance of water in our life. How many times, and all these questions when asked, they're more for us to just kind of go over. I took everything from this presentation from Ignatian Spirituality. So it's something that we have to reflect on and really think about how we're doing in our lives and what we're doing to help improve our lives too. So how many times is the word water in the Bible? Now there's very different <laughs> answers online. Some tell you depending on the translation, but um, the most common number I got was 722 times that we see water in the Bible and we know what it means to us. Now for our bodies, for our health, how much water are we drinking? How much are we taking that in? Here in California, we live by the coast, we're at the beach. Right now we can't go out as much. Um, but what does water symbolize in our life? I know when we do a lot of reflection, we use the waves, we use the sounds of the beach to kind of relax ourselves. So we have to take in consideration the importance that water is in our lives. Um, so where I'm going with this is a lot of the students, when I would have them come in, you know, they'd be like, I don't feel good, or they're always coming in with their sodas. Sometimes we're always coming in with our coffee, but we forget that it's very simple and very basic, just, you know, start drinking water and kind of detoxifying ourselves. The next one is food. Um, did I have breakfast today? When will I have lunch? What am I having for dinner? And it's not so much about, you know, the healthy aspects. I'm not here to talk about that. But in the nation spirituality, they talk about how important it is for us to share our meals and to really enjoy our meals. A lot of us, because we're living so, um, so much in the fast lane, we just inhale our food and we go on to the next thing. Or sometimes we go six to seven hours between meals because we're just working, working, working. And then we're like, oh, wait, I'm hungry. I should eat something. But it's not only what we eat. It's when we eat and how we eat to actually appreciate the colors in our food, to see what we're, what we're putting in our bodies and to really enjoy that taste. Cause you know, sometimes, especially when we have a home cooked meal, um, we have to really appreciate who cooked it, if we cooked it, where it came from, to really take the time to before our food to say a prayer. Cause sometimes, you know, we'll do this and just start inhaling our food cause we're on the go. And it's one of the most important things that, you know, even before COVID, you know, sharing a meal with our friends, sharing a meal with you, during our region meetings was so important because that's the time we were talking, we were really enjoying with one another. We were sharing the condiments on the table. And it's something that even right now with pandemic, I know some of us are quarantined or, you know, we're limited to who we see, to still keep that in with us, you know, with our meals, who we share it with, and to really enjoy what we're taking in. The next one, exercise. I know a lot of you are like, no, not exercise. But the reason I bring this up, and it's because um, I had, a, I popped in on a couple confirmation courses during this pandemic, just to see how the youth ministers were doing, how the kids were doing. And the response I got from the kids and the youth ministers was that they felt sluggish, they felt bored, you know, they just felt lethargic. And so I asked them, I was like, okay, well, you know, the CDC is recommending that we go off for walks. How many of you guys have gone out for walks? And I kid you not, it was probably like one kid and you know, Stephen, <laughs> he went on walks. Um, but the rest of the group was just kind of like, well, no, I've been really busy, you know, for the adults, it's work, it's family taking care of everybody. And for the students, for the youth, it was like, well, I have homework and I have courses to go over and, you know, I have reading to catch up on and then I have catechism classes on top of that. So, you know, they couldn't find the time to fit that in their schedule. 
And so on top of, you know, exercise helping all of this, you know, for those of us who suffer from anxiety, from panic attacks, you know, just getting up and just taking a break, taking, you know, 10 minute walks. Um, I have a window right in front of my computer here. And every once in a while, I'll see the bishop just do his laps. <laughs> so it's one of those things that I found like, okay, if the bishop has 10, time, 10 minutes to just, you know, walk around the building, enjoy the sun out, you know, I can probably fit 10 minutes of my time to just go out for a walk or just go out and stretch. Um, because like going back to what we've heard from all of us right now is we're kind of fight and flight. We're trying to figure out what we're doing. We don't know what we're stepping into. A lot of programs are starting in a couple of weeks for catechism for confirmation and, you know, everything is in the uncertainty. And that kind of like rises up, you know, any, for example, you know, any more anxiety or we have high blood pressure or anything like that. And it's important to squeeze in at least 10, 15 minutes, you know, to kind of get us off the stepping point. And then, you know, go into that 30 minute walk that's recommended. Nothing too much, nothing, you know, out there. I know some of you may, may follow Father Capo on Instagram and you're just like, oh, I'm not that extreme. <laughs> um, but it's, it's motivating for us to also get us back into the rhythm. The next one, social interactions. Right now with the young people, it's very hard for them because they don't see their friends. They're not able to hug their friends, same with family members, you know, because we don't wanna, you know, put at risk those family members that maybe have pre-existing conditions or, you know, they're in the risk group. It kind of, you know, puts a damper in how we used to be before COVID because we were so used to being with our families, with our friends. So something I started doing um, was I started ordering postcards and this is an image of St. Didicus here in San Diego. And so what I did was I bought a bunch of postcards. I bought a lot of stamps. And so what I've been doing is, you know, asking my friends, hey, you know, send me your address. And so because I tried sending full on letters and halfway through the page, I was like, I'm running out of things to say. <laughs> so it's one of those things where just, you know, fun postcards, put a stamp on it, mail it out. Um, we tried to do this with a couple of groups of young people and they were so excited because first of all, they were learning how to write, you know, on a write the address on the letter because they didn't know how to do that. They didn't know what stamps were <laughs> for, for the younger kids. Um, and it was very exciting for them to get something in the mail, something physical, something they could read, something that somebody took the time to write for them. And as adults, as leaders, you know, we appreciate that too. And it really does give us that boost that we're looking for. We, you know, we call each other on the phone, we text. Um, it's good to have virtual game nights with our families community service um, is also a big one. I know Bishop was talking about, you know, what are we doing out there, you know, to help those in need. I know here in San Diego, Catholic Charities has about 20 parishes who serve as food pantries. And one of the biggest needs they had was to get drivers because a lot of the people that were asking for, for pantry items were senior citizens who couldn't drive. And so we saw an uptick of young adults and young people who myself included, who signed up. And so they, you know, told us this is your nearest parish that serves a food pantry. And, you know, of course, gloves, masks, everything to be protected, but we were out there in the community just delivering food. And that helped with the social interaction of going out, helping people. Not the same as before where you usually, you know, they would give you a hug or a handshake, but it's still there serving the community and you're still out there doing something. Um, and it's something that I recommended to, to my youth ministers as well as our kids or their young adults, because as youth ministers, we also have to put ourselves out there and remember, you know, there's people in need and I know that we're busy, but even if it's just an hour of driving around delivering food, I mean, you're helping someone out. And, you know, that's the whole point of social interactions, to get to know one another, to help one another, and to keep each other in prayer. And with that prayer, I know a lot of us as leaders, they office and leaders and everything, you know, we pray for other people. We take the time to, you know, a lot of us carry around notebooks, you know, when someone says, hey, pray for me, we write it down so we don't forget. Um, and I know it's a little bit chaotic in our, in the time of COVID, but, you know, take a second to just think of, you know, what does your prayer space look like? If you're able to, who are you praying with? You know, right now our prayer space, especially, you know, coming from Mexican household, um, I learned a lot from my mom so that, you know, I have the one wall in my house that has, you know, La Virgen de Guadalupe. 
I have my big cross, I have all my votives, I have, you know, the 20 rosaries my grandma and my mom have given me over the years. And so I know that every time I pass that, that section of my house, it reminds me like, okay, this is, you know, time to, you know, turn, light on the candle, say a prayer. Um, I live with my brother, my sister-in-law, my nieces, so it's time for the, the girls to come and pray with us. I've also tried to join a couple Bible studies with a, with a, a couple friends of mine from high school just to kind of get us in the moment and really interact with one another, see how we're doing, but really read the word of God with one another and come together as sisters in Christ. Um, prayers during the, <laughs> for those of us who are really busy, um, if you follow, follow the priests who are very active and they do a lot of exercise like Father Capo or Father Rob Gallia, you know, you can see that they're talking about, you know, going on runs and praying the rosary at the same time. I know my mom, um, when I was a kid and she would be doing housework, she would have her headphones on and she would be listening to the rosary on the radio while she was doing her chores and she was praying along. Um, same thing with driving during our meals, praying with our family, praying with our coworkers. This is a big one that I've told youth ministers here because we know sometimes um, there'll be issues in staff, you know, they don't get along or it's been, you know, things where long days, there's a lot of stress. Um, so I tell youth ministers, well, you know what? Pray with your coworker. If you're having problems with them, invite them for prayer. It, you know, it's the time to swallow your pride and really come together because even if it weren't a pandemic, we're supposed to be working for something bigger than us. We're supposed to be working for the greater glory of God. And this is those times to really come together in prayer. And now that we are living during these times of pandemic, this is an even more time to be praying with our staff, to be praying with our coworkers, um, just to kind of keep us going, make sure we don't fall into those pits of desperation and stress that can ultimately lead to these negative, um, these negative feelings that we might be having. And then finally, I have some bonus things just to talk about. Um, there's a lot of research coming up uh, right now that during the pandemic, because we are in fight, and fight or flight mode, a lot of our sleeping schedule is off. And it's because of the stress, the unknown, we have a lot of work. So here's a few tips from the Mayo Clinic just to kind of, you know, what we can do to better help with our sleep. Um, everything that I've talked to, there's things that I've completely done the opposite. <laughs> For example, just last week, I decided to have a Red Bull at 4 p.m. So, <laughs> so I got a lot of chores done at one in the morning. So it, that wasn't healthy, of course. You know, there's going to be setbacks. Um, but just keeping these things in mind, where I'm like, okay, I got to do better. The next morning, I had a lot more water. I made sure that my alarm was on a little bit um, earlier than usual just to kind of set me back into my, you know, my regular rhythm and to get back into things because it's going to happen. Um, like, for example, I know we were talking about food. There's days where, you know, the whole week, I'm like, I'm eating salads, I'm eating, you know, my fruits, my veggies, I'm drinking water, and then the weekend comes and, oh no, somebody got a pizza from Costco and I ate half of it. So it's things that are going to happen. We're human, but just to make sure that we know that we can always reset and start over, you know. Um, so it's okay when it happens. May, um, the next one for health. This is a personal thing that I wanted to add. Um, I have really bad vision, and even before the pandemic, I was kind of holding off on making my appointments, you know, the dentist, the optometrist, I'm like, well, it's not an emergency, I can do that later. And then when the pandemic hit, I started realizing, oh, you know what, my vision is getting a lot worse. I think the stress is making it worse. So I finally made an appointment with my optometrist, we talked about it, and he told me that a lot of the, um, the patients that are coming in were having issues because of the pandemic too. So, you know, for whatever we have going on, it's good for us to make a regular visits to our healthcare providers to make sure that we're feeling okay, that we have someone that we're talking to as well. You know, in the last couple of months, NFCYM has offered great um, talks about mental health. A lot, we've seen this not only there, but we've seen this in various um, platforms. And we always talk about, well, talk to someone, talk to a professional. <laughs> Sometimes we don't do that ourselves, you know, for our own well being. And this is the time to just kind of think about, okay, When's the last time I talked to a doctor? You know, maybe should I make a schedule with my therapist, to, you know, just to see how things are going. Um, and then finally, the last thing breaks and that this was a last minute addition because it popped into my head this morning about how, you know, I don't know how it is somewhere else, but in the state of California, you know, you work your eight hours, you're supposed to be getting two breaks and a lunch. And I think in the last couple of months, I don't recall ever taking a break. Yeah, I'll get up and stretch. 
but I'm always like, you know, running things in my mind. I'm getting up, I'm doing this, even if it's to get, you know, water down the hall. You know, I'm talking to people about work that I need. And it's like, when's the last time I actually took my 15 minute break and just, you know, enjoyed those 15 minutes, maybe read a little, take that walk around the building, you know, to really kind of reset again for the next, you know, couple of hours. Um, especially if you take that break from the screen. I know right now, you know, we have long days and we've been having long days, but have we really taken the moment to take, even if it's just 15 minutes? You know, because there are going to be times where we feel overwhelmed and we feel like, you know what, I just got to keep pushing. It's just one hour left, one hour left. And sometimes, you know, if we just take those 10 minutes, we could better work towards that one last hour that we have. And then the final last one, have I planned my next vacation or staycation? It's one of those things that, you know, unfortunately, some of us, you know, we work months on end and it's just, you know, what we love to do and everything. But there's going to be times where, you know, we really do have to plan our vacation out, even if it's a staycation, just for our own benefits and to make sure that, you know, we get, um, we become Christ centered. You know, we spend that time in prayer with our families. We go out with our families. We have fun with them see our friends and to really make sure that, you know, our well-being is in the forefront because we've all heard this expression. When we're on an airplane, we have to put our oxygen masks on first before we can help others. And if we feel sluggish and if we feel like, you know, we're falling back, we're feeling overwhelmed, stressed, we're full of anxiety, we're not going to be able to put out our best work. Um, and we're not going to be able to help out others as much as we know we should be doing. Well, come on, you guys, look around. Don't look at me. Stretch around. You're just, you're barely listening to me as it is. Stretch around, look away, blink your eyes. Uh, to go from the, the deep philosophical ideas and then going back to basis. Commander Cruz, that was fantastic. I'm sure you didn't see in the chat room, but people were blowing you up there. So lots of great, lots of great notes, right? Before I have to worry about the pirates that are boarding my mission statement for my ministry, I need to make sure that I've like, eaten, I've had something to drink, and I've gone to the bathroom, right? Seriously, basics. Great, great job. So I think that hit home for a lot of people. Uh, so, so terrific. I'm going to move us to uh, Chris. Chris, you should have uh, all, all sorts of rights for sharing, et cetera, et cetera. And then we're going to make a, a stage from there. Chris, you have the floor. Awesome. Thank you. Well, I, I think uh, what we're all sharing is is some great uh, information, especially when it comes to, especially what's coming up next in, in our discernment process of the year. Uh, I think uh, as not only do we need to be experts, but uh, I think our expertise can limit us in our leadership capabilities because uh, only ex the expertise that we have can get us so far with our people, with what we do in ministry. So um in this, in this next part, I'm definitely going to jump th right through it, but it's really all about how do we take our expertise and now accentuate how do we make it better with our leadership. So uh, a lot of information that I'm getting from this was uh, I, uh, from a book called Launching a Leadership Revolution from Orrin Woodward, Chris Brady. I had the pleasure of being uh, mentored by Orrin Woodward. Uh, for a little bit of part of my life and uh he just has some great insight and uh definitely this this is not just uh I, he's a very faithful man very christian man but also a great leader in his own retrospect so he him and his partner basically broke down leadership into five leadership levels and in these leadership levels they're they're not just levels of leadership they are levels of influence and i think that's a big part of what we do in ministry so as you can see we have the learner we have the performer we have the leader himself or herself we have developed leaders and then the developed leaders who develop leaders and i think these are if you if we break it down this simply it allows us to really get in touch with who who not only who are we actually leading but how where what part or where are we at the moment and as you can see in this slide um it actually has the different uh points in each one. So uh, just going into lean, learner right now. So who, who are the learners in, in our midst, right? We have students, seminarians, youth attendants, young adult attendants. These are the learners that we're going to have probably the first interaction with our, with our ministries or with, with the ministries that we serve. So this is a top priority of where we need to focus as are we develop, like uh, we've heard from, um, the past speakers about are we how are we engaging them coming into 
our ministries, how, especially with, uh, with Bishop Thomas, he, I mean, that was by far like mic drop his whole talk. Right. So uh, are we, are we allowing the learners to be a part of, so uh, learn and especially as a learner part, they have to learn from the best results. So us as leaders, how are we giving them the best examples? So for instance, uh, when COVID hit, one of the things was I, I knew my ministers are great with technology. I'm not the best at it, but I knew I had to get online to make sure I show the, the, the programs that are out there that, we, that it is possible. So I said, I'm not going to have anybody else do it. I'm going to do it myself so I could help the learners to see what is the best result of what we, what we can do. Then we need to also give them as learning, uh, we have to teach them that it is science, that there are techniques in learning and that it's all about people and the process. How do we allow them to understand that leadership is about the people? That's the, that's the main result. That is the main product of it. And then, of course, leaders are readers. It was so funny. Uh, one year we did a confirmation retreat. And then one of, our, uh, le- one of my confirmation uh, Retreat directors asked one of the youth, hey, do you mind being a leader? He said, sure. And then he came to the meeting and he saw these other leaders there. And he goes, wait a minute. This is not for reading. He said, yeah, you, you could read, but you're going to lead us, <laughs> help lead retreat. And, and it's so key that we understand that, that uh, as we, we heard from even Bishop Thomas, right? And also uh, Christianity. We're getting books. We're getting things that we need to make sure that we are diving ourselves into into that um, process of learning. And then the next level is performer, right? So core team leaders, retreat leaders, volunteers, TAs, transitional deacons. These are the performers. The, this is where re- relatability is learned. This is where I think we, ha- we have to teach because there are so many types of people like we've learned from Armando with the four sections of, of where people are in our ministry. Are we b- being relatable to where they're at? And are we building this block? This is the building block of, of our ministries is where the performers are at. And there, uh, there will always be critics in, as a performer, right? I, I don't know, if, as, as we all know, as, as leaders and d- directors, that we're always having people saying, okay, why don't you do this? Or why don't you do that? Of course, we could take in the, the, the different um, you know, uh, suggestions, but of course we have to make sure, but as a performer, we have to be next to those performers in our parishes and in our, in our, in our programs to make sure that we're also giving them the positive side of what they're doing. And of course we have to prepare in this uh, and big one is belief that we can always do better. Okay. Performers. Yes. They, they are the easiest to be knocked down. That's where us, us as us as leaders have to be really walking through with them, especially when it comes to a training process or system. Then the next part, the next level is the leader. So retreat directors, catechists, priests, then the, this is where they really focus on the results through team effort. And as, as we know, as retreat directors and catechists that we, we definitely uh, need the support of the community to build what we have. And it's a, uh, and this is where people have the first buy-in. It's usually, it's not the program. It's not, you know, some people it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not the message. It's usually from the leader. Our personal invitation is key in this, in this part of building community and building uh, programs around us. And then this is another part of where development comes into play. We have to learn how to develop just like Bishop Thomas. Again, I, I loved his talk because it chalked, checked off a lot of the things that we, I was going to talk about today and development of our young people, of our youth, our young adults in not only the programs that we have, but also into the liturgy, into the church. Are we developing them to understand the church, not just spiritually, but also religiously and in doctrine and in, in the teachings of the church. And we have to allow, and this is where they learn that we, this is where we pay the cost. This is where they learn that it is. I, I did a, 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 a retreat training last week, and this is where I, sh- I share with the young people that we are going to have sacrifices in our life. And this is where this is really played out into when we are developing and even in ourselves where we learn that the cost has to pay, be paid if leadership is, is the end result. 
And of course, this is where we become servants and also we learn to orchestrate around us. Then in developing leaders, the next level, that's our youth ministers, young adult ministers, DRE, CREs, pastors. This is where we, we create the level of duplication. I think this is a key. Uh, what I've, I've always uh, really made sure I, I, I put into play is that can I make the system duplicatable? If it's not duplicatable or if it doesn't work for everybody, then I need to tweak it to the point where it can help everyone. Okay, so duplication, we, this is where we start having big visions of what we have. And then this is where recognition with our leaders are key. You know, if, if we have these, uh, I know after every retreat, I make sure that the, our parish or the organization, we have a dinner for them, that we, we recognize what the, the sacrifices that they have had, right? They, that they actually paid the cost and we could give back to our, to our people. Do, and this is where we compel team results, that we allow the team to understand this, this, this is an effect of all of, our, all of our, our doing and what we do. And as a developing, as a leader that develops, we need to make sure this is where we start to, to take in the talent or we look for the talent. You know, I, you know coming into the Archdiocese San Francisco, I really made sure I had my list of people that, that I know that I could turn to or see that, you know, this is possibly an opportunity where people can have in youth ministry and where I could help develop them, especially in the professional side of what youth ministry is and especially what ministry does. And of course, mentor. Uh, again, Bishop Thomas shared, uh, you know, this is where mentorship is key. You know, we cannot lead leaders unless we're being led, right? One of the sayings that we shared a couple of weeks ago, the best servants, uh, the best leaders are the best followers. And I think that's key, especially in a Christian life. Our, our major leader is Christ himself. And if we don't follow Christ himself and try to do things our way versus his way, then usually we'll fall short. Okay. And of course, this is where we empower the leaders to the next level, which is developing leaders who develop leaders. As Dyson directors and as Bishop himself, uh, he gave a great example of this level, what he shared this, this morning with us as leaders that want to share with the developing of the, the whole organization of what we do. And I think that is very key. And, and this is where the vision and the leader are now intertwined. This is where our vision is becoming not just something that we do, it's something we live. And of course, uh, this is where we attract leaders for the cause. Not, not, not are we just developing and we're finding you know, new, new performers every day. Now, can we, create, can we create a program that attracts leaders for a cause? So where are you? Where are you right now? Are, we, are you leading? Are you, are you learning, performing, leader, developing leaders? I know I'm not necessarily at the developing leaders who develop leaders yet. We're getting there, but now I, I myself and our show San Francisco, we're developing leaders. So you could be at any point in your, in your, in your leadership kind of, I guess, your, your, where you are right now as a leader, you could be in different parts and you could be in different parts for different, like I know like when we hit COVID, I had to be a learner again. You know, I had to be a learner of what are, are the options or what are the things that I need to learn. And let me tell you, technology has changed my life. It's given me so many new things. And, and now we're, as we're performing, now we're developing leaders. So again, how are you, where are you and how are you developing yourself through this, through this process? process.